Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Mark Ellis. Well, welcome to the greatest movie news show in the solar system. We're not sure how many planets actually <laughs> exist here at the moment, but it's somewhere in the area of eight or nine. My name is Mark, and boy, do we have a great show. We hope everybody there had a great weekend. We're going to be talking box office, a new Ninja Turtles clip, and Dan Merle versus is John Campia. The smack talk <laughs> went crazy this weekend. Ashley, who's joining me today? Also here, John Schnapp. Hey, what's going on? Uh, had a really fun, wet uh, adventure in Sacramento. Of uh, Really fun hanging out with everybody. I'm glad to be That's back. That's what he said. Oh. <laughs> also uh. here, Dennis Zen. Uh, also, we want to talk about uh, Schnappy. You got a Heroes panel. We got a Collider Heroes panel oh, that's at right. WonderCon on Saturday. That's right. March 26th yeah. uh, at 7.30 in room 152 at WonderCon, which is uh, the Los Angeles Convention Center this year. Come on down. It's a Heroes panel. All the regulars will be on there. Campia, Umberto, Robert Meyer Burnett. You got Chris Gore. You got Amy Dallin. Uh, so it'll be a fun-filled uh, sweat-a-thon. So bring your weird, sweaty nerd questions, and we'll answer all of them. We're going to start out. We'll introduce ourselves. We're going to get right to your questions, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. So come by at 7.30 to 8.30, and then what happens after that, Dennis? Then we're going to have a meetup, and this one you don't need a WonderCon badge for. You can just show up, too. We're still scouting out. Uh, I think uh, Ellis is doing some research. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to go downtown. Every night this week, Schnepp and I are going downtown to different bars, and right. we're going to see which one one is the most conducive to a meetup environment. We want a lot of open space. We definitely want tables where we can say hi to you guys and hang out. And most importantly, the beer must be cold. And what yeah. we're going to tweet out like 37 minutes before me and Ellis show up at a bar. <laughs> we're going to tweet out so we give you an opportunity to buy us drinks. We can actually do, just do a bar crawl. Just have fans like out there with like rickshaws ready to uh, run us from one might, bar to the next we one. We might have to do that. And, and for those of you who won't be able to make WonderCon, we are filming the Collider Heroes panel and we'll be putting yeah. up not that night but probably the next day or the, the the day after so you guys can watch that as well sure there we go so let's kick off the news topics this week which what we usually like to do is the box office recap mm -hmm. hit me ashley it's monday which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at amc theaters for the second week in a row disney zootopia takes the number one spot bringing in 50 million dollars and crossing 100 million domestic total in just two weeks 10 Cloverfield Lane came in at the number two spot with $25.2 million. Deadpool and London Has Fallen went neck and neck with the final outcome going to Deadpool with $10.8 million for the number three spot and London Has Fallen taking in $10.6 million for the number four spot. And at number five, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot with $4.6 million. Mark, thoughts on this weekend's box office results? Well, there's a lot of happiness in there, Ashley, because Zootopia is a movie that I really enjoyed. I think a lot of other people finally got a chance to see it this weekend and $50 million is a great great haul for your second week in action and then i'm also thrilled about cloverfield because 25 million dollars for a movie that we pretty much didn't know was coming out a month ago we start seeing these trailers it was a really cool ramp up to that campaign there was a lot of secrecy surrounding what exactly is going to happen is this a sequel to cloverfield how is it going to be related to that movie and i think that audiences wanted to check that out i don't know how it's going to hold up week to week because it was so reliant on its secrecy and nobody knows anything about this movie so now if the cat's out of the bag a little bit, will it do comparable business to what we think week two? Will it do 12 million? How, will, how long will the drop off be? What I'm really surprised at is the Brothers Grimsby, though. Holy God, I forgot the movie came out because I saw the top five and I was like, ah, that looks pretty good. And then way down there at number eight is the Brothers Grimsby, just over $3 million in over 2,000 theaters. That is damn near close to Gem and the Holograms take. The movie was not that bad. Was it good? Not really, but it had comedic value in it, and you would assume just with those trailers that those made enough people laugh to want to go see the movie, but what a bomb that was. Dennis, is that what stands out to you about this weekend's box office? Uh, yeah, I mean, that that, and then also Zootopia only dropping 33% in its second weekend. Yeah. I finally got to see it on Saturday night, and there was like, it was packed. It was like a late night showing. It was packed. There was tons of kids there. And I was like, wow, this movie's going to do very well in its second weekend. For me, if you guys watch Friday's show, I, I predicted that the, the top four, the one I missed was the fifth one. I put Brothers Grimsby. I thought it was going to do better than 3.2. I put it at number five. It was Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. I ran into Josh McCuga yesterday, right before the, the Walking Dead recap show. He was bragging about how he's like, oh, yeah, I got four out of the five right. 
But he missed the first two. Like, he swapped the first two. Uh, he was like, oh, yeah, I got four out of the five. I was like, but you didn't get the top one, so that doesn't really matter. I don't think Makuga understands how these things work. Yeah. So no, that's, that's right. Makuga, math is not Makuga's strong suit. It's more he's the guy you go to to find the bar for the meet and greet, not necessarily who you rely on to get the box office numbers straight. Schnepp, what stood out to you about Maybe Makuga should join us on our bar crawl. Uh, that sounds like a very dangerous as as and very fun He's not in charge idea. of the numbering system. You know, this like Thursday a, is a great opportunity to actually go look at bars it is st patrick's day but before we put Ooh, on our green shirts that might be too rough you know <laughs> uh I, what do i think about this I, I think it's great i'm glad that 10 cloverfield lane uh got some money i thought it was a really fun film i got a chance to see it uh it really reminded me of like a twilight zone kind of black mirror really cool like like a, a really good like uh spin at the end not like a Shyamalan spin but it, it definitely had that twist at the end i thought goodman was terrifying um, you should check it out if you get a chance. Uh, and yeah, Grimsby, I forgot it came out too. I didn't even remember that until you just mentioned it. Oh yeah, that came out. And I think the reason it failed is because of those trailers. Like what you say you saw was a lot funnier than what you were prepared for. What you were prepared for was the trailers, which were not funny. They were awkward and strange and weird. And it just looked like, ah, I don't want to see it. So. It was such shock value comedy, but you couldn't show it in the trailers. Like, ah. like you just simply could not, even in a red band trailer, I don't know if you can get away with this stuff. They had that, you know, that famous clip on Jimmy Kimmel where Sasha Baron Cohen said, look, we're not allowed to show you this, but we're going to show you the audience reacting to it. So that seemed like a clever way to get people talking about, oh, what is in this that I need to go see in the theater? Spinning it forward, do we think that that's going to have any long-term effect on Sasha Baron Cohen's career as far as making movies go? Because I know he's in the new Alice in, the, in, in Wonderland movie, but him as a star, he definitely has the ability to be a comedic lead in a movie. Do you think he's going to get that opportunity again? Not, I mean, he will get the opportunity again, but people will be a little more skeptical about him as the main attraction. Alice in Wonderland, he's what, the main villain? Right. He's, you know, he was in uh, Les Mis, you know, right. that type of stuff. I could still see him getting those roles. And then in leading a comedy, though, I think studios are going to be a little sca uh, scared. That's yeah, but right. he, he could always go back to doing Ali G or one of his other characters and do a lower budget, kind of a Borat return. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the guy is incredibly funny. It's just a lot of mi uh, misfires. So <laughs> Somebody put out the Borat signal. We need it now more than ever. <laughs> Speaking right. of signals in the sky, what's our next story? Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice screenwriter Chris Terrio, who is also the writer of Justice League Part 1, recently spoke to the Wall Street Journal about writing both Batman versus Superman and Part 1 of Justice League, ruling out the chances of returning for Part 2. He said, I have written Justice League Part 1, but I won't necessarily write Part 2. This has been the most rigorous intellectual exercise I've had in my writing life. Citing the amount of research needed for each film, from Amazon mythology to life inside the Mariana Trench, all inside the huge canon of DC Comics as being some of the reasons. Terrio also compared Batman vs. Superman to Empire Strikes Back, the second movie in a trilogy after Man of Steel with Justice League being the third in a saga. Schnepp, thoughts on Chris Terrio's comments? I think the comments uh, are really smart. I'm really excited to see what he did with uh, with Batman v Superman, and more importantly now Just League. I think you know from the amount of research, the Marianas Trench, uh, Amazonians, it, you get the feeling that there is going to be a little bit of a battle between Atlantis and uh, uh, and the Amazon and the Amazon. So I don't know how they're going to play that out. If that's going to be part of the the lead up to the Justice League, or if they're gonna, you know, introduce Brainiac to get that be the, the first Justice League. But it sounds like he put in a lot of work, and just from the way he's talking about it, he really makes it sound you know, like it is. It is tough to make something like that plays really well as an episodic thing on in the comic book page to translate to the big screen. So. Dennis, this isn't a situation where they're not going to pay the dude a ton of money to write Justice League 2. So if you see this guy and he's like, I don't know if I want to write Justice League 2, is it a play to get more money out of DC and Warner Brothers? Or is it really just a guy who's burned out, who's being honest? I, I actually hope it's a play to get more money because otherwise I'll be concerned. If you're writing the story of a part one, everything you set up in that part one, you want to be follow through and execute in part two. And if he hands off the reins to somebody else and go, oh, well, this is kind of what I wanted to do but you go ahead and do it. I'm a little worried. I, I hope it's a money play. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is the J.D. Salinger situation where the guy's just like, look, I'm tired of being holed up. Right. I can't write anymore. He already broke all the ground, like you mentioned. Like, you already did all the research. Right. Just You know where you want to take this, right? When you started writing Justice League, you knew where this was aiming. Can another writer come in and take that baton and run with it and finish the lap? Sure, and I think it could end up fine, particularly if the dude is really burned out. Like, I go back to the Joss Whedon thing when he said, look, I'm just 
just done directing and everybody watched Avengers Age of Ultron. I really enjoyed the movie, but you can watch that movie and surmise that maybe the director is just getting a little fatigued about doing something on a scale like this, getting all the budgets right, making sure that you get all the studio notes and you put all the scenes like the Thor hot tub time machine. It's like, oh, I got to put that in there. So fine. I didn't really want to. But as a writer, I don't really understand the the burning out process if you're talking about working on a project like you've already done Batman versus Superman you've already done Justice League one maybe he's still working on Justice League one maybe he doesn't like the notes that he's getting from a script standpoint but I'm not sure that why he wouldn't want to continue writing on that unless he actually is just burned out is, is he going for more money <laughs> that's the sound of the truck <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a, a, a the sound of money backing up into his new golden mansion. He's just going for Scrooge McDuck cash. He just wants to be swimming <laughs> Look, through gold coins. You know what coins. he's saying? Hey, man, you know what I made this for the the small. Uh, and now it's the California King. We were talking about that earlier. You know, he just did the standard size bed for Just League. Now he's got to get that California King for Just League too. I mean, know? the other thing I take out of this though is that it does sound pretty cool. Like all the work that this guy's done. Like you were saying, this the, the power struggle. He even researched a bunch of like American issues when it was like power struggles from one hand to another mm -hmm. hand, and like you know warring factions in that vein so it does sound like we're gonna get a lot of cool mythology in justice league i just hope that it doesn't feel fatigued from the audience standpoint and also remember he's an oscar winner and he's talking about this is the most rigorous intellectual exercise in writing he's ever done right that must say a lot so hopefully we see that on the screen and no mental exhaustion whatsoever <laughs> what's up next napster founder sean parker last week announced plans for new movie streaming service called Screening Room that would provide first-run movies streamed into the homes of viewers for $50 a movie. And according to a report from Variety, Screening Room has now the backing of Steven Spielberg, Peter Jackson, J.J. Abrams, Ron Howard, and his producing partner, Brian Grazer. With such Hollywood heavyweights back in the controversial adventure, insiders believe the service will take off. Screening Room will charge users $150 for access to the anti-piracy equipment set top box with $50 a movie and as much as $20 per film going to theater owners. Dennis, what do you think of the new streaming service? Well, we briefly talked about this on Friday. I think it came in as a Twitter question, but in general, I've had multiple conversations with different people all over the weekend because this is kind of a big subject. I mean, what insiders are like, oh, this is going to be a huge success. Like, I just don't see it. There is there a market for this? Yeah, but it's a really small market. I can't see people going, okay, uh, I'm going to pay $150 for this box and I'm going to put it on top of, you know, whatever I already have, my cable box, my Xbox One, my PS4. I'm paying for that. And then every time I want to see a movie, I'm paying $50 more. I mean, th that's the thing. Movies aren't competing against movies anymore. Movies are competing against television, video games, comic books, YouTube videos, everything. I just don't see where they think this market is yeah but if i paid okay look 150 dollars for the box i can shell that out okay i paid 100 i paid 300 dollars for a ps4 i've used it twice but it's there and it's <laughs> nice to have if i'm paying 150 dollars for this magic device that can somehow get me first run movies that are in the theater i am totally paying for that and then i'm calling my good buddies ashley schneff and dennis and maybe i'll give riley jonathan and adam a shout out too <laughs> they all come over and i'm like hey guys either bring suds or bring me five dollars and you can watch Star Wars Episode 8 with me in the comfort of my own home. I think it's less of a competition standpoint that you're not worried about, oh, can we compete with Netflix or can we compete with, you know, networks or cable or anything else? I think it's more a fact that people sometimes just get tired of dealing with going to the movies and all that that entails. People have been asking us forever to make a theater etiquette video, just like what to do and what not to do. The best way to do it is maybe to avoid it entirely. I have no problem paying $50 for big event movies. Where it's going to suffer is the smaller movies. Like, nobody's going to pay $50 to see Clover, 10 Cloverfield Lane opening. You're just not going to pay 50 bucks to see that movie. I really wanted to see it. Not going to pay 50 bucks. But Star Wars, Batman versus Superman, Civil War, I will pay $50 to see that in the comfort of my own home when I don't have to deal with all the other cretins that are out there <laughs> ruining my movie theater experience with their cell phones, with talking, with spilling a soda on me. I don't want to deal with all that stuff all the time. I know I sound like a grouch 
you just, old man. Just because you hate but people. <laughs> I despise groups of people. It doesn't mean I don't want to go have a theater experience. So that's where I'm conflicted because I do like the huge screen and the sound effects. But if you have a nice home theater already, it might also be good if you have a family, if you have three kids. Mm. And it's like, oh, my God, I'm pretty much showing out 50 bucks anyway to take them to the movies. Why don't I just get Zootopia in my house and the Rugrats can sit there and be mesmerized by them for two hours and I can get my taxes done? Right. Snap, you got to break this tie. All right, here's I have some questions about this new set top box. How many times can you see it? Is it just like once it starts screening, it's over right after it's no, done? No, I think within a 48 hour window, you can watch it multiple okay. times. Can you pause the movie? I, I think you can pause Ooh, the movie. So that's good. It, like, we're going to have to change the title of this show to Collider Movies at Home Talk <laughs> in the next year if, if this does take off. There's a, there's a bunch of issues. There's two sides to it, I think. I think one side is that everyone is cutting their cable you know, boxes. They're yeah. cutting the cord, so to speak. I don't want a brand new cord that I have to reinstall it. You know, it's like, I don't want to have to get another cable yeah. box. So that's what they're asking you to do is basically, hey, you just freed yourself of this weird, you know, television slavery. And now you've got the internet, you can watch whatever you want. But here's this other thing that's going to be like, you could, you know, like another cable box, basically. What is it giving you? It's giving you that freedom to not have to drive to the theater, to pay for the parking, to pay for the, you know, maybe you and a date, all of a sudden it's 45 bucks, then getting popcorn and soda, you're talking about $60. Now you're $50, you never left your house. The fear of that is that you never leave your house and we're developing a society <laughs> of strange mole creatures, which will just be like blinking weirdly with giant fingers like, what's this, what's this, what's this? I mean, I'm fearful of that. It's already happening with idiots voting for Trump. We got a bunch of morons on this planet. I mean, I, I, we need to stop this now. I think if Spielberg and Jackson are backing it, remember Lucas and, and, and Spielberg were talking about the death of the theaters in the next 10, 20 years. They're like, you know, they're a little shaky on that. I'm not saying they're profits or anything, but what I'm saying is they're like seeing how the market is going with home theater. All of us have giant TVs now, um, you know, amazing ways to see film at your house. It's different, though, than going to see a movie and nothing will ever replace that. I don't care if you have a cable box, or you pay 50 bucks. I agree with you, though. Families might be able to have more fun with being able to. You know, uh, you know, get movies for their kids right away. Uh, we can have parties like movie parties, like we've done Game of Thrones parties. Like, yeah. come on over and watch this. We could do that with movies too. I'm not against it, but I don't see it taking over seeing films. You are right, though. The independent films will suffer. So I don't know where I feel right well, now. You can about still it. go out and see an independent movie. And first of all, I don't like the term party. Okay, if you're gonna come over and watch, it's not gonna be an episode eight party. Okay, you're coming <laughs> over to watch the movie. You're coming over to. Do, shh, that's all you're gonna be doing. At Ellis's house, no one talks. <laughs> <laughs> don't clap. Don't cheer. Barely don't say breathe. Anything. I don't I breathe. I paid $150 for this box. Pause the movie. <laughs> we can't right. pause it. Shit, we'll just have to watch it again next time. You guys get the hell out of my place. <laughs> don't you think it'd be cool to come over to my place, though, and, and pay 10 bucks? <laughs> and we'll, I'm serious. Like, come over. All you have to do, you pay $10. In a I shroud, a silent. Look, look, with in an ideal world, sure. But the thing is, as you guys know, we're all busy people. We have different schedules. It's, it's hard to get your friends together for a specific thing. And, and look, us here at the table, we're going to watch Batman v Superman early at a press screening, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I've already got my tickets for AMC Prime for opening night. I've already seen the movie. Why am I doing that? I want to see it on a big, giant screen with great sound. And, and, and then not only that, I want to enjoy the experience with other people. I want to hear what the audience reaction is. It's something I, it's something I wrestle with because, look, I do love the theater experience. Don't get me wrong. I do. Well, I get excited. You ever see the original Annie when they do like a whole song and dance just because they're going to the movies? That's how I feel <laughs> inside. But I get there and sometimes there's issues. And it's like, why am I putting myself through this? Right. For an opening night comic book movie experience, there's nothing like being in the theater. I just I think this is this is convenience for the future. And one of the reasons why you got a guy like J.J. Abrams or Spielberg or Ron Howard or whoever else backing this is because they can say that they wanted to be part of the new technology right off the bat. I'm sure there were famous people that backed Divix. I'm sure there were famous <laughs> people that backed LaserDisc because they want to get in front of it just in case the thing actually pays off. This is one of the things I really want to hear from the fans. What do you guys think about this controversial new technology <laughs> that we might have in our homes sooner rather than later? Do you guys want to pay $150 and then pay $50? Do you want to come over to my place and watch a movie for 10 
seven dollars. That's what I'm at thinking about charging. So basically, hey. you're gonna you're gonna pay for the movie fifty bucks, yeah. and then you're gonna get ten people yeah. over to pay ten bucks. That's so then smart. you're gonna make a profit. TV party tonight. Wow. Yeah. TV that, that's party why, tonight. That's why Ellis likes Good this idea. Yeah. Is, Black flag, it's, ladies Ellis, and gentlemen. Ellis is gonna be scamming his own friends, <laughs> yeah. charging them more than he's paying. We got Rude. nothing better to do than hang at Ellis's and drink a bunch of brew. Remember that TV okay, party? Well, okay. Well, look. If I go over to benevolent Uncle Dennis's place uh -huh. to watch a UFC <laughs> fight, is that totally free? Because yes. you paid like seventy bucks for that yes. fight. Okay. I, I, ask the people that have come yes. watch yes. UFC. Then I get place. to go see a UFC fight at your place yeah. for free. You can come see a movie for free. All right. Ashley, do you want to do this service? Um, hell no. Honestly, for fifty dollars, you know, personally for me, I don't have any babies. I don't have to pay for anyone else to go see the movie. So I could see like three and a half movies in LA mm. for this price. And I remember, like, I tell me if I'm wrong, but I remember Napster having like going through a lot of issues with piracy and stuff. And I feel like people are gonna find a way. They to, always find a way. They always find a way. This is just gonna open another avenue for people to start pirating movies. And I feel like it's just gonna kind of go down. Totally got there. the pirate box. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like it's, the, people are gonna yeah. figure it out. I love that we had a great debate on this, and we close it with a Jurassic Park quote: "Life." Finds a way. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> now it's time for buy or sell. This is the portion of the show. I'm glad this wasn't a buy or sell because I'd be out 200 bucks. We are going to tell you guys whether we buy or sell a topic presented to us by Ashley Mova. Ashley, what's up first? A new clip has been released for the upcoming sequel to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows. In the clip, which debuted during Nickelodeon's Kids' Choice Awards, the turtles are in action, driving their new van against the Foot Clan in a huge stage stunt sequence. The sequel is directed by David Green and adds in Stephen Amell as Casey Jones with the turning cast remember with, with turning cast members Megan Fox and Will Arnett. Alan Richson, Joel Fisher, Pete Polzak, and Jeremy Howard reprise their ro role motion captured roles as the Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows opens in theaters on June 3rd. Mark Byer saw this new clip from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Well, if I can shell $150 for the box, I'm definitely paying $50 for the Turtles. This clip was awesome, man. I really liked the action in this. I thought that the van looked pretty realistic. As far as like the action goes, the effects were cool. I liked the the inventiveness of seeing the nunchucks on the edge of the van. I'm not sure if anybody else on this mm -hmm. panel is going to buy this clip, but I thought it was really nice. You get to see the personality of the Turtles, how Michelangelo is still the party dude. Raphael is just that crazy loose cannon nutcase. He's the he's the meta world piece of the Turtles clan. He'll, he's willing to just sacrifice his life. He goes out there. He kicks some ass. He comes back in. What do you want me to do? Dude, next. Raph is a scary dude, man. Do not get on the wrong side of that guy. I liked what this clip did. It made me feel like I was watching the Ninja Turtles animated show in the early 90s, which is how I was introduced to the Ninja Turtles, as opposed to by the more violent comic books in the 80s. Dennis, do you buy this? So at first, when I played this clip, I didn't read that it was at the Kids' Choice Awards. Mm. So they show that whole <laughs> part in the beginning yeah. of like Casey Jones running around skating. I was like, Wow, this cr camera looks crappy. It looks like video. I was what like, this, this choreography looks terrible. He's like not hitting them and they're falling down. And so at first I was like, this looks awful. Is this the clip? And then I realized that was the actual award Dude, show. No, that's exactly what happened to me too. And then and then the, the actual clip itself, I buy it. Yeah. I, I know that Schnepp, myself, and Campy were one of the few people that actually enjoyed the the mm. last movie. And I thought it was funny with the, the with the giant. No, I think it's just over the top silly is it going to be you know this awesome great movie no but it, it looks like it's going to be entertaining and you know what this clip had in it it did not have megan fox and will arnett i didn't hate them in the first movie but it was nice to see just the turtles go on a right. mission schnepp you buying uh i i buy the first part that weird air hockey <laughs> thing no no uh, you know i felt the same way i was watching i was like what the hell is this what, the, what is this second movie? It's like this dude skating around on a yeah. weird purple stage. I was like, this is so cheap looking. <laughs> How is this possible? And then I was like, oh, they're Shredder. Okay. So then they show the clip. And yeah, I buy the clip. I thought it was fun. Uh, I'm not like a, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles diehard animated fan or even the comic book fan. I just like it. And I and I actually liked that movie that a lot of people didn't like. So, you know, maybe the, you know, the... You know, I'm, I'm not the, the target market, but I thought it was fun. So, And this clip definitely showed 
the turtles interacting with each other. It was a kind of dumber sense of humor, but it was fun and it was done right. So I mean, overall, my concerns for the movie are still that you're injecting these new characters into the plot, which I approve of. I, Bebop and Rocksteady and Casey Jones, I think that's a great addition to what we already have. But the first movie, my complaint was we didn't get enough turtles. We got a little too much Megan Fox right. and a little too much Will Arnett. So are we still going to have to deal with them in the same capacity that we did the first one? Or can they be the ones to just kind of get shuffled off to the side because we have new characters and we want to see the turtles? We'll have to wait and see about that. But for now, we buy the clip. What's up? Star Trek Beyond will head back for some reshoots this week, and they are significant enough to add a new cast member to the movie. According to Deadline, House of Sand and Fog actress Shohre Ardashlu has been added to the movie, with sources saying she is playing a character in the high command of the Federation. The third movie, directed by Justin Lin, is written by Simon Pegg and Doug Liman, with Idris Elba playing the villain alongside returning cast members Chris Pine, Zoe Saldana, Zachary Quinto, John Cho, Carl Urban, and Anton Yelchin. Star Trek Beyond opens in theaters on July 22nd. Jeanette Byers saw the new Star Trek Beyond reshoots. Boy, I I don't know. Like, that's a weird one to want to buy because I guess I'll buy it if it makes the film better. Um, I, they have to do these reshoots, obviously, to make the film better. And, and they're, by adding a, a brand new character that wasn't in the script, my guess is that they're taking a lot of little characters who are like kind of peppered through and making all of that one character to, to force a through line to force one of the a b or c storylines to make that more of a b or a storyline make it stronger and, and and cut through sometimes when you try to have a lot of little characters interspersed with the main characters the storyline you know kind of wavers a little bit and i think that's what they're doing is they're just streamlining whatever star trek beyond is about they're streamlining it by adding one core character unfortunately that means a lot of other characters are going to get sorry you're on the cutting room floor you've been replaced by what's her name again that's such an awesome name. So yeah, that's my guess. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it right now. Okay, uh, Des, we know the movies go through reshoots a lot, and it always is cause for panic because we just don't know. Wait, what are you reshooting? What's going on? Do you buy or sell this one? Uh, I will buy this one. Yeah, shoots are becoming the re the norm now, especially with larger, big tentpole movies because they they want to get everything right. Um, and also, we haven't heard any kind of rumblings about any disarray about this movie set maybe if we had heard something like oh my god you know justin lynn's not getting along with simon Pegg or blah 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 like that type of stuff but but this is sounds like a little different but yeah adding a new character though is different because usually when they re do reshoots it's so they can kind of either alter existing scenes or they want to add on top of something maybe missing this sounds like a whole story addition so that that's that's in the most interesting part. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think this is a situation where they had to retool what the movie was or the tone the movie was going to be, even though fans, by all means, didn't react kindly to that sabotage trailer that we saw a couple months ago. So I don't think that's a situation. I think this is probably something that they already had in the works. As soon as they were done shooting the movie, it's like, okay, well, we're going to look at a cut, and then, you know, we do need a new character here. What's the importance of that character? I don't, it sounds pretty important from the title, The High Command of the Federation. Boy, does that sound like somebody ordering people around but we don't know that we, we don't we don't know enough to s i'm gonna i'm gonna sell it because i don't like hearing about reshoots particularly with the movie that's already been as maligned to star trek beyond so i'm gonna sell the fact that they had to go back and reshoot an entirely new character i'm not cool with that it might work out great i hope it does but when you hear about a movie doing reshoots like you said dennis it's like oh no we wanted to get this we wanted to get coverage on this we realized we we had a gap here this is a new character and so that makes me a little nervous on a project that is already given a lot of fans call for concern so i gotta sell it look she already has the little star trek symbol so she's used to wearing little star trek and, and you know she's got that already built into that her very, outfits this is a very nice piece clipped on what's her name yeah. again ashley Shohre Ardashlu. damn that's really good <laughs> let's let's talk batman v superman all right with about 11 days before batman versus superman dawn of justice dropping in theaters the marketing team behind Zack snyder's anticipated follow-up to man of steel is working overtime releasing a new international trailer this morning showing us new footage of Batman fighting Superman with other quick glimpses of Wonder Woman played by Gal Gadot. The movie stars Ben Affleck, Henry Cavill, and Gal Gadot and will finally arrive in theaters this March 25th. Dennis Byers saw the new international trailer for Batman vs. Superman. I buy this. I mean, it's only a minute long. I buy it because there's more Batman and having more Batman is never a bad thing. I've been, I've been having arguments with people about Batman vs. Superman in terms of popularity because I say while Superman is the more iconic superhero, Batman is the more popular superhero. I mean, he his movies make more, he sells more comic books, he sells more merchandise. I mean, and listen to this, 
Uh, Batman in in movie franchises is top five all time. Superman, not even in the top 20. Superman didn't get the same shot, though, that because Superman the movie came out like 10 years before Batman did, and so Batman was a different time. I agree with you, by the way. I'm just playing devil's <laughs> advocate here. I think Batman is Batman's my favorite superhero of all time. Sorry, the Punisher. You gave a hell of an effort. Superman, sure, he's more iconic. More athletes have the Superman tattooed on their chest than they do the Batman logo, but Batman is, by all accounts, the one that I'm looking forward to in the movie the most, and you're right, Dennis, that's what this international trailer shows us, is more Batman. We get to see that Superman's a threat, but almost like if you watch this trailer and didn't know anything about these two characters, you might guess that Superman is the bad guy. Yeah, right. You know, he he looks like the Lex Luthor who? Superman. He's the enemy we gotta defeat, and I'm kind of with Batman. Let's go kick some alien ass and maybe be friends at the end of it. This trailer did a good job of not giving us away too much that we didn't already see. It had a couple new shots in there, but I like the tone of the trailer Trailer, so it's a big buy for me. Whatever you think about Batman versus Superman, at least we get Batman. We know he's going to kick ass, right? It's not. It looks that way. I mean, yeah, I, I'm going to buy this international trailer. You get a lot more little tasty nugget shots of stuff that we've already seen, but just a little bit more. And it's really well edited. It's put together great. I cannot wait. I mean, how many more days are left? It's insane. Like right, 11 so it's coming days. coming out the 25th, so it's not this Friday, but it's next Friday. So I'm hoping uh, against hope that there's a press screening coming my way early next week. So yeah, maybe yeah. a week from now, I could be sitting at this very desk and saying, guys, I'm seeing Batman versus Superman in my own house. Come over. <laughs> It's going to be 10 bucks. Yeah. 10, 10 bucks and I'm buying 50 no, people. You're going to see his press screen is $50 and each. Then, and then yeah. like when, when you sit down at Ellis's house, he's like, oh, wait. You want a soda? Five dollars. <laughs> so oh, I'm charging I, movie theater prices, baby. I don't. I don't mind that they're playing Superman up as the villain of this film because I think what the, what this film is going to do is really like kind of like he's gone through this trial by fire and through Man of Steel, destroying Metropolis. Now he is the villain. He is the alien of this piece, and I think by using Batman as the foil to make Superman a stronger uh, character. So I think that's what it'll, it'll obviously form the Just League. We'll see Wonder Woman. So I think everything that we're, I'm seeing from this movie is really exciting, including this trailer. So I mean, you bring up one of the big pressures this movie has, though, is that, Dennis, you're right. A lot of us are going into this loving Batman more than Superman, at least in movie form. So the movie has to, obviously, we're going to be rooting for Batman somewhat because he's the human, but it also has to do a good job of reminding us why we love Superman, too, yeah. giving us both sides of that perspective. Perspective, so we're kind of torn, at least at the beginning. Hopefully, we get all that and more a week from now. Ashley, do we have any more buy or sells? Yes, we do. A new trailer for Alice Through the Looking Glass, the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, has arrived just in time for daylight savings time, suggesting that the hour we lost yesterday was actually stolen by the film's villain, played by Sasha Baron Cohen. Mia Wasikowska, who plays Alice, returns to the whimsical world of Underland and travels back in time to save the Mad Hatter, played by Johnny Depp. The film also stars Anne Hathaway and Helena Bonham Carter, along with the voices of Alan Rickman, Stephen Fry, and Michael Sheen. The film will be released May 27, 2016. Mark Byers saw the new trailer for Alice Through the Looking Glass. I am going to shock myself, and I'm actually going to buy this look because it was short, it was to the point, it showed all the wonderful imagination of Tim Burton without boring me to death, and I didn't like the first Alice in Wonderland movie you did. I was not a fan of it. This one, I don't have high hopes for, but just watching this, I like how they played on Daylight Savings Time. I thought that was funny. It just, like, it, this one worked for me. I still don't think the movie's going to work. I know the job of a trailer or a clip is to sell me on the movie. Didn't necessarily do that, but just this clip as a self-contained piece, I like seeing I like seeing a lot of Sasha Baron Cohen, whatever the rest of the world thinks. And look, it's 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 no, no land that I really want to go back to, but I do buy this clip. Uh, I'm going to rent it. Uh, <laughs> I also, like you, was not a fan of the first one, yeah. but the Tim Burton isn't directing this one. James Bobbin is right, who, who right, did uh, right. the, Muppets. The, the Muppets movies. He directed. Uh, that's why Sasha Baron Cohen's in it. He directed Ali G, Flight of the Concord. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of putting my faith in him. This this actual little short trailer actually, you know, it was cool. We, we saw the visual style is still the, similar to the yeah. first one of Tim Burton, but hopefully James Bobbin brings his own take to it. That's right. And we get to see Alan Rickman on screen again. So 
That'd yeah. be cool. What do you guys I'm going to buy it when I go see it at your house, Ellis. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you $15. You might have to because not a lot of people are going to be coming uh, over that night. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to buy it. And You know what? This trailer was fun. I like the uh, – and you're right. There's that's that. There's a, a humor to it that wasn't in the first one, and that's definitely – you know, it's looking at, you know, probably Bob and, and Cohen, like especially that shot of him looking at the skull. It was like some quick edits where I was like, oh, that's, that was funny and weird. So I think the sense of humor is going to be a lot weirder. Depp still bugs me as the Mad Hatter. He just bugged me in the first movie, too. So That dance? You love that dance. Yeah, right? couldn't, I can't wait to see that dance again, kids. <sighs> <sighs> so anyway, it was very colorful. I'm going to have to drop you know, 20 tabs, whatever. If somebody goes to WonderCon and cosplays as the Mad Hatter, please come to our fan meetup <laughs> afterwards and just freak snap oh, out. Oh, God. Well, kids, it is time for that show that we call, the portion of the show we call Mailbag, where you guys write in emails. Ashley picks a few to read to us. If you guys want to get your question read on air, just email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. And we also want to remind you guys, at the end of this show, we're going to be taking some of your live Twitter questions. So if you're watching the show right now, and thousands upon thousands of you are, please tweet us at Collider Video. Ashley's the gatekeeper. Be very nice to her. She's the one that is going to get your question on air. So Ashley, what's first in the mail? Bag. Josh Miller writes, Collider Crew, everyone mentions when the book is better than the movie, like The Hobbit, The Hunger Games, etc. The list goes on. But when were the movies better than the books? The only one I can think of is Silence of the Lambs. Can you think of any others? Keep up the goodness. I mean, I can think of a lot. To quote the great Jim Gaffigan, it's because there's no reading, so movies are always better. <laughs> Maybe not. That, that's not necessarily the case. I'm sure there's a lot of books that have been better than movies. I'm trying to think. I th did they make an Animal Farm movie? If so, it was not as good as George Orwell's they book. They made a couple. I'll give you that. But there is, there's inarguable examples the other way, too. Jaws was actually based on a novel. Peter Benchley's novel turned into the masterpiece that was Steven Spielberg's 1975 classic Jaws. Um, I was also thinking about another one that I'll have to come back to. Dennis, what do you uh, got? For me, it's not exactly a book, but it's a comic book, and I know some fans are going to get upset when I uh -oh. say this. X-Men Days of Future Past, the movie, was better than the comic book one. I remember reading it when I was younger. I was like, oh, this is so awesome. So I, I bought the digital version before the, the movie had come out, and I reread it. And it's, like, really short. It's, mm -hmm. like, two issues. And it doesn't – not like – it was still good, but it was just – it didn't have the story that, right. that the movie had. And they even kind of tricked you because they, they're, like – they always show you how many pages a comic book has before you buy it. They actually threw in the issue before Days of Future Past that had nothing to do with the storyline. They were up in Canada hanging out with Alpha Flight. I was very upset. So that's one that the movie is better. Schnapp, we know you're a huge fan of the book, Fifty Shades of Grey. What did the movie do for you? Oh, boy. Well, first of all, Dennis, you know, can't can't be ripping on the Claremont burn run. I'm not ripping on it. No, I'm just I saying know, the movie's saying. It was pretty thin. It was thin. It was just a different, entirely different film. Uh, for me, I would say uh, I'd love to bring this up. Uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is a completely different uh, story than what became Blade Runner. So Blade Runner was based on that book by Philip K. Dick. It's a very different book. I mean, it has certain things that are similar and a lot of things that are not similar. There's the memories and there's spider dreams and things like that. But that one comes to mind. And then I'll say something that might piss off some uh, diehard fans. I actually love David Lynch's Dune. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a big fan of Frank Herbert's Dune. It just... I couldn't get hooked into it. Maybe I tried reading it. It was like way too young. But for some reason, I could not get that into the the Dune books as much as I loved the the weirdo David Lynch Dune with everyone talking in their mind. Is he the Quetzalcoatlic? <laughs> such a weird film. Uh, Clockwork Orange is one where oh, I yeah. like the movie more than the book. The book's still great, but yeah. uh, uh, the, the visual style that Kubrick brings to it, it you don't see that in the. In you know the what's book. great about that is that Kubrick just. He didn't even have a script. He just brought the book around, yeah. and they just shot the book. He did cut the ending off, too, though. Yeah, well, I mean, there's some changes, <laughs> yeah. but, I, I, yeah, that's a good one, too. That's pretty Clock cool. I think Orange. The Shining, too. I mean, I know Stephen King wasn't a big fan of Hated what Kubrick it. did with Hated The Shining, it, yeah. but The Shining movie is pretty tough to beat. There's going to be a good competition in a couple of years between the book versus the movie Ready Player One because everybody loves that novel, but Steven Spielberg working on that movie, that could be a masterpiece. I also just remembered Casino Royale, too, was like one of the original Bond books before it was the movie that we saw fairly recently with Daniel Craig and Forrest Gump was based on a novel. I can't imagine that novel. I'm sure it was great. It was as good as the movie that, yes, beat Shawshank Redemption. Sorry, that's how it went down. Life is like a box of books, right? <laughs> so back to one. Chocolate. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, Mark writes, hey guys, I stumbled upon your videos only a few weeks ago and have become an instant fan. My question to the panel is, what has been the most disappointing film you have ever seen that you were actually hyped to see, i.e. Prometheus? First of all, I love that it's just Mark writes. It's like, oh, well, Ellis wanted send to get this a question in? on that. Yeah. I did not send this question in because I don't like thinking about the times that I went to a movie theater <laughs> super hyped, right. couldn't wait to see the flick, and left crestfallen the first time it ever happened it was like i don't know do i go speak to a counselor now and it was after batman forever i was just like i was like what just what did we blow it what just happened i was so excited i waited an entire semester in school for it to let out school got out that week and then i went to go see batman forever with my friends and we all walked out that u2 song was blaring confusing me i'm like did that just what the what just went down i didn't hear danny elfman score once this mm -hmm. was awful who is joel schumacher and what did he do with the great batman i know and love that's the biggest one for me indiana jones in the kingdom of the crystal skull is a Ooh. movie that i was like because the, the refrigerator explosion thing happens at the beginning Ray, wait, and i'll early. give any movie a pass once i'm like all right it was done it was stupid and we're done let's have an adventure with indiana jones and it just keeps I mean, shia labeouf swinging yeah, around with mo monkeys trees. with greaser <laughs> hairstyles remember that it was yeah. like what the, is this the movie sword fighting that looked awful oh my god it was just not a good what movie a nightmare around i'm sorry dennis well i mean phantom menace is an easy one to say yeah. so i'll skip over that one uh, Terminator Salvation. I was hyped to see that. Mm -hmm. Like at that time, Terminator Sarah Chronicle Chronicles was on air, mm -hmm. and I love that show. So I was hyped to see this. The trailers were awesome. They had the Nine Inch Nails song playing. The visuals look great. You had Christian Bale playing John Connor. Right. And then I even went to like a thing before the movie came out that had McGee was speaking about the movie, and he was talking about it. It just sounded so awesome. And then when I saw it, it was just a bunch of people yelling at each other the whole time. <laughs> really disappointed right. in that one. Get out of my eye line! Yeah. Right? That yeah. yelling is yes. what you're talking about. Yeah. I could see you! You! Get out of my eye line! Which the funny thing, the funny thing about that is the only person who really did his job was the DP on that movie. That's right. Yeah, it was very well lit. Um, I'm not going to bring up Phantom Menace, only to say that I did stand in line. <clears throat> for a very long time, not multiple days, but like a couple hours. Uh, Ten bucks, could have come to my place. And I uh, <laughs> could have just seen it at Ellis's, but I didn't have the cable box back then. In fact, no one did. Um, and I remember staring at my seat while the movie was on when they were talking about taxes or some kind of weird Federation trip, and I was like, I can't believe I'm bored at a Star Wars movie. I was staring at my chair right in front of me. Hated the film. I know most of my friends were brainwashed and came out, wasn't it amazing, Darth Maul? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Double night tape. Shut up, you morons. <laughs> Didn't ever phase me. I hated it from the beginning. So, but here, let's go right to now. Some things I hated recently. The counselor. I remember, hey, it's really mm. Scott. Look at all these amazing actors. My God, it's Fastbender. You got Brad Pitt. Got, I mean, Cameron Diaz. Can, she can do good sometimes. It's like a Penelope Cruz. I mean, what is, what's going on? Oh, what's going on? It's a horrible garbage film. That's what's going on. That was disappointing. Well, she didn't uh, help a windshield. So, you yes. Had that. that was actually a kind of a cool scene. Uh, now you're bringing up some good stuff about it. But um, Let's Be Cops, another one I actually walked out on because I was so psyched to see the, the trailer made me laugh so many times. We saw the movie and we did that look. Me and Holly were like, we're out of here. It was a garbage <laughs> film. And then uh, yeah, finally, favorite movie or something. Yeah, yeah let's, we, let, we went yeah. together. And we, we we laughed. Let's Sorry. be not funny and stupid and horrible. <laughs> okay, um, that's how you want to play yeah, it. Yeah, I do want to play it that way. You know what? <laughs> I'll play the last one. My last card, The Amazing Spider-Man Two. Totally bought into the hype. Ate every single one of those sandwich trailers. Delicious. I was like, can't wait to see this. Mm. Totally makes sense. Oscorp makes all the villains. They finally figured out Spider-Man. What a garbage film that is. Total disappointment. Hated that film. The less said about Jamie Lee Fox, along comes a spider. Get out of my life. Wow, man. A lot of energy from hey, you man, in that segment. I'm looking question. at the chat board right now. You guys are lighting the chat board up with your nominations. Thank you guys for participating in the conversation. We got uh, Mortal Kombat 2 is one. A lot of the Transformers movies, Iron Man 2, The Nightmare on Elm Street reboot, and somebody mm. brought up the one that I actually, it's worse than Batman Forever. I repressed it as a memory. Godzilla. 1998, Ooh, the one with yeah. Ferris Bueller and Hank Azaria and a bunch of velociraptors yeah. running around Madison Square Garden. One of the worst takes on anything I've ever seen in my entire life. Thank you, and I hate you at the same time. <laughs> Whoever made me remember that movie that I successfully forgotten about entirely. Okay, well, that is it for Mailbag. Now it's time for the live Twitter questions. Let's get cracking on what the kids are saying right now. What do we got first, Ashley? Gregory Dopp writes, what's your favorite segments of movie talk or other collider shows? 
I mean, just the fact that they have a microphone that's plugged in and a camera aimed at me is pretty sweet. I don't really care about the segments. Like, I'm just happy to be here and have a job and a place to sleep. Um, I do like buy or sell. I, I like making things a little competitive. So buy or sell, we get to sometimes unite as a crew or we get to have divided and then we have fist fights afterwards. So <laughs> buy or sell is one of my favorite ones. I also really like address the council on Jedi Council because we get to, it's, anytime people get to write in and focus their tweets on something Something specific sure. to as Star Wars, we get to kind of geek out about that for a minute. I enjoy that. When you do write in, I think it's hashtag Collider Jedi Council. What about you, Dennis? Uh, it probably have to be mailbag, both either on the weekend or during movie talk. I just like answering fan questions. We get some interesting ones, especially when they they bring in like a different angle or different perspective that 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 creates a discussion that we actually have. Do they write into Collider Video at Gmail dot com to yes. get on mailbag? Yes. Okay, you heard it here first. <laughs> Yeah, for me, for myself, I like like we what we just talked about, like the cable box for yeah, brand. That's great. I mean, when when situations like that, where it's like for me, it's like yeah, we'll talk about movies and how much money they made. I don't care how much money any movie makes because I don't make any of that money. It doesn't really matter to me what's popular, what isn't popular. It matters to me what the movie's about and if the movie's good or if it sucks. That's what it matters to me. So when we get into discussions about content of films and or new technologies, things like that, I love that. And of course, Collider Heroes hashtag Collider Heroes. Pimping the shows. Uh, that's one of my favorite shows that I do on this uh, on Col at Collider here. So so I get to nerd out and people ask weird questions about like what whatever happened to Metamorpho. Well, we'll be answering that on Heroes, and no one else here knows what Metamorpho is. But it's it doesn't matter. A, uh, it's not a cable box. It is not. It could be. It's called Screening Room, and now it's twenty dollars. <laughs> Ashley, what's up next? Mario Della Torre writes, "Who do you think is the best person to die story wise than replaced Tony or Cap?" Ooh, so what's better for the story? As far, like, like, first of all, if somebody has to, I don't want either one of them to die. I want them to get a few cuts and bruises and be like, hey, you know what? Let's be pals and go fight, you know, Thanos. Um, if one of them has to die for story purposes, I think it probably works better if Captain America dies because it's like, oh my God, the guy representing this country is dead and, and maybe Tony killed him. Oh God! What? Who do we root for? Do I? Do we just root for Thanos in that situation? Right. Like these superheroes hate each other. Who do we pull for now? How are you going to pull me out of the depths? And then who would you get to replace Captain America? Who steps into those boots, Dennis? Yeah, it's Captain America, and it's for the reasons of who can replace him. Where you would have like either Falcon or Bucky replace him. Where with Iron Man, if he dies, who's? I don't see who who's like Tony Stark. Yeah, there's nobody that can replace Tony Stark with the personality, the energy, the money. Schnapp, what do you got? Yeah, and I also like that, you know, just that they'll be following the comics. They're calling it Civil War. That's what happens in the comics. It seems like that makes sense. And the storyline, the trajectory that they're going feels like that's going to make sense. Well, obviously, we all know that Captain America is not going to stay dead. It's just like, who is going to be the new Captain America? Oh, that's obvious we know that? Yes. It's, it's obvious that it's he's... obvious. Do you think he dies in, in Civil War? Yes. You think he dies, you think he dies in Civil War? I think they, he goes away and then he comes back later. He, he goes away like in a coma? <laughs> goes or he just away with goes bullets away to in like, him. Is, is he right. just going to sandals in the Bahamas? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, something he... like that. Okay, yeah. Kat, you earned some vacation. What do we got next, Ashley? Jen H writes, what's your earliest memory of being at the movies? Earliest memory of being at the movies. Uh, rumor has it I was on an Air Force base in 1982 and somehow they got a <laughs> copy when I was a kid, uh, like a baby of Empire Strikes Back. So I think that was officially my first move, but I don't remember any of that. My first memory of being in a theater um, was either the Transformers movie that Dennis is pimping on his shirt right now, mm -hmm. the one in 87 old, or 86, or uh, Flight of the Navigator was another one that I remember being in. Flight of the Navigator and King Kong Lives. So Flight of the Navigator is good. I mean, my parents told me that they had taken me to Disney movies in the theaters, but I don't remember those. The one I actually remember is actually Empire Strikes Back. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Do I mean? Do you remember? How, like, like your was your brain able to process? That, I, oh my God, that's a dad. Well, no, I was traumatized. I was traumatized. Really? Like mm. I came back because you know when you're younger, I we, I didn't see Star Wars in the theaters. We watched Star Wars on you know on VHS at somebody's house, like a group of friends. Oh, you and, came over a group of friends yes, celebrating a movie yeah, at somebody's but, house. Yeah, but I didn't have to pay them any money. <laughs> 
Um, Zing. Bing bong. And then, I, and then I just remember seeing that in the theater because you know everyone loves Star Wars, and I was just so like when I came back home, I was like, no, it's not real. I, I was like Luke, right? It's oh, not real. No. It's not real. Why no. didn't you, no. Mom? Why didn't you tell me, yeah. Dad? Why didn't you tell me, Chef? Uh, what do you got? Earliest memory of being in a movie theater? You know what? I was gonna say Pinocchio in space, but I think it's actually Jaws. Is like I remember being frightened. I grew up right along the shore in West Haven and it took me and my sister many many weeks to want to go back to the beach it was it was a frightening it was a traumatizing experience Jaws scared the living hell out of me and it was a it's a really great film I mean even as an adult you see it as an amazing film as a little kid it can change your world do you remember what the first time you went back in the water was like in the ocean was it like because even when I go in the ocean yeah. today I still hear the music and I have to like get over that psychological hurdle before yeah. I can enjoy wave riding I remember it was a couple weeks yeah yeah okay good man got right back up on the horse what's up you guys I have a more defying story about my oh, first yeah, memory yes um obviously i went to go see the disney movies and stuff when i was younger but one movie i remember seeing was some my parents took me to see something about mary and <laughs> there's this one scene where ben stiller has something on his ear hair and cameron cameron diaz reaches for it because she thinks it's hair gel and the whole theater's laughing and i'm like mom dad like why oh. why, why is everybody laughing like what is that and my mom's like i'll tell you when you're older and oh. now that i see it when i'm older i just die of embarrassment for some reason because that is so mortifying as a parent. Why are you taking me to that movie, Mom oh. and Dad? I don't understand. Wait, wait, wait. It wasn't. It wasn't hair gel. I guess it wasn't hair gel. I uh, sounds like I need to play some. You phone need call to watch to the mother. movie again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's do uh, two more. Okay, David Frazier writes. More important writer or actors? Uh, more important writer or actors? Uh, I got to go writer, man. I think if you don't have a good story, there's nothing that you can do. There's nothing a great actor can do. You can give a great performance, but the movie is just not going to win. So if you wanted the best movie experience, I think a story is where you start. That's the foundation upon which you build a beautiful house or a crappy shanty, depending on how the actors are. But if you don't have that story foundation in place, nothing else is going to work, in my opinion. Oh, that one's tough because you need both of them, right? You need a good yeah. story and you need good acting. Um if I had a gun to head, I, I, I probably have to go with acting because I just, every time I watch a movie and the acting's bad, it just takes me right out of it. And then I just don't feel like I'm even watching a movie anymore. Yeah, I mean, like, it, 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 if they're horrific actors, yeah. like they're so bad, then yeah, it doesn't matter how good the story is. But if they're just capable actor, like if they're just okay enough, I think you can get away with a good story, Schnapp. Uh, to me, it has to be story, it has to be the writing, uh, bar none. There's so many garbage films that are out there with horrible actors and bad scripts and bad direction. But when you get a good script, you can tell it's like a, you have a you get a good cast. Sometimes actors will rise above and add that extra layer, but you have to. It has to start with the story, and not just the story, but the writing, the actual dialogue. So that that is the key to a great movie is the way that story is written. So has Justice to be League way. Two, we hope you're listening <laughs> to us, Ashley. Last Twitter question All right, of the day. This one breaks my heart. Rye Hickson writes: Key and Peele's Keanu got majority of bad reviews at South by Southwest. Does that hurt your anticipation? It doesn't hurt my anticipation, but it is a bummer to hear because I think a, a fan base like who's attending South by Southwest would be so up for seeing that Key and Peele movie, Keanu, with that adorable kitten on the poster. So hearing that, that they didn't overwhelmingly love it or maybe even a lot of them thought it was bad, that is a bummer to me. I try not to let those expectations crowd my head when I sit in the theater or on my couch to see a movie, but um, it is a bummer, <coughs> Dennis. I'm not going to lie. This is a setback hearing about that. You? Um, I'm still optimistic. The people that I know that saw it enjoyed it, so I, I, I I'm looking forward. Oh, to Oh, because they so. enjoyed it, but did, I mean, did, was it did it meet their expectations? Do you think? Because it looks hilarious. Uh, I know one of them did. Okay, yeah. that's good. Good for me. Well, I, I just heard that right now. I, I missed the boat on that. I saw them introduce it online. I saw them introduce the film and. Both Key and Peele were like, hey, this is a work in progress. It's not done yet. They were kind of apologetic about it, and so was the director. Whoever introduced it, introduced Key and Peele, I'm assuming it was the director, but they were very apologetic about it and saying it's a work in progress. So it, just seeing that and not knowing what the reactions were was a weird to me. I was like, why are they so, you know, they're like, it's a, it's a lot of things are going to change, and if you don't like it, don't say anything about it, but if you love it, say it. They were like, that's how they introduced the mm. film. And now hearing this, it, it does have me worried. But the one thing that I do know is they have time to go back into the editing room and change it. 
That's what they that basically they were saying. We'll fix things. We're going to change things. Comes out in what a month and a half or something. Yeah, I mean, look, if you're using them as a test audience, that's a big risk because they love to be on social media and they're not just going to tweet if they like the movie. Maybe you get something like Trainwreck last year, which debuted at South by Southwest and everybody loved and got a lot of positive media buzz. Doesn't seem to be the case so far with Keanu, unfortunately. Well, that's all the time we have today on Movie Talk. We want to remind you guys about a few activities going on here at the Collider Studios, the biggest of which is going to be the Movie Trivia Schmodown, which debuts the same day Batman v Superman is in theaters on March 25th. And my God, this weekend, if you are paying attention to social media at all, John Campia versus Dan Merle from Screen Junkies this is the first matchup. Campia had a video go up, and then Merle had a video that go up, and they are just going at at each other talking all sorts of trash it is phenomenal to watch and then we put a poll up christian put a poll up from his hollowed out volcano which gets great wi-fi the who do you think is going to win is it going to be campy or is it going to be merle thousands and thousands of people voted you know what the final tally was 50 50 this thing is such a dead heat and it's actually such a dead heat that riley are you over there Mark Riley's over there. He's going to put up a poll. Who do you guys think is going to win between John Campy and Dan Merle in the movie trivia showdown? He's putting a poll up on Collider.com right now. So make sure you already should be going to Collider.com for all your movie news. Now go there to vote on who you think is winning, Campia or Merle. Break this tie before you see it happen next time. Friday. I do want to thank everybody here at the table and everybody behind the scenes, Adam, Jonathan, Riley, and especially Mr. Dennis Zhang. Dennis, where can the kids find you? You guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZENG. And John Schnepp, where are we going tonight in downtown LA? I don't know, maybe <laughs> maybe the Gopher Lounge or the Crib Crap Please or uh, Fram Framples. Maybe we're going to Framples. They're right next door to yeah. each other. You guys can follow me at John Schnepp uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Check out my Kickstarter, uh, Sweaties Unite. It's all about comic book culture. Let's let's help uh, boost it. Damn right. And Ashley Mova. Mark, do you want to explain to people why we're an hour early today? Because I got so many people tweeting us like, why are we an hour early today? We have daylight saving time. We, no, we don't today. We had it yesterday. Well, if you it know, took you a full 24 hours, look, I know it's hard <laughs> to set the clock back on your oven. Okay, we all have to do it. It's annoying. We got to do it twice a year. Figure it out so Ashley can at least plug where we can find her on Twitter. Yeah, and our yeah. digital phones kind of do it for you. So it should, your phone should Get be telling it. you what time it is. It's daylight saving time from yesterday. So Get we saved it. an hour. And we are, that's why we're all more extra time. <laughs> well, you guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. Happy Monday, guys. And hopefully you guys get your clocks adjusted and get to the right showtime by this Saturday when I will be at the World Famous Comedy Store on Sunset. We're doing a big promotion. You guys can get tickets at my discount code, Schmoes, this Saturday in the main room. I think showtime is 7 or 7.30. We'll figure it out, and I'll be on stage at some point during the show. You can follow me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. And check out my YouTube show I do with Christian Harloff, who's here in Collider as well. Schmoes, no. Subscribe there. Subscribe to this channel. And make sure you guys check out AMC Theaters. AMCTheaters.com for all your latest showtime and ticket information. And that's all we got for you guys today. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Daylight savings time for Movie Talk. See you then. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.